Jennifer. I am so excited to welcome you today. I'm so excited to chat with you. I know you are a wealth of knowledge. So Mm -hmm. I want to just first off, like, have you share more about your story, how you, you know, came into like one, becoming an FDN practitioner and specializing, helping women, specifically women in that perimenopause stage where lots of changes start happening um, and helping them, you know, just take control of their health um, so Mm -hmm. that their periods don't have to be so excruciating. Right. What a good word, Erica. (laughs) It's so true. (laughs) Excruciating. Actually, I was thinking about it today, what I wanted to talk with you about, and I wanted to call it like the agony of perimenopause because (laughs) it really does get kind of excruciating around that time. Um, but yeah, I can tell you how I came to this space. So, um, I, I have four children and we were having some issues with my third child, just really bad skin issues. He had severe eczema and we took him from doctor to doctor to doctor. Um, he would be playing in the hose or taking a bath and he was like two or three years old at the time. And his skin would just kind of like erupt and open up and like ooze. And it was awful. I thought, is my kid allergic to water? What is going on? You know, we couldn't find any answers. And so finally a friend's father um, was a chiropractor and he ran a, like basically an MRT, a food sensitivity panel on him. And we found that not only was he really sensitive to casein, so he'd been drinking like five bottles of milk a day. Cause I was like, here, it makes you happy. I have some more milk. Um, but he was also severely intolerant to chlorine and, you know, of course, chlorine's in our water supply. So it makes sense that every time you take a bath or, you know, every time he would play in the hose, his skin would start to erupt. Um, So having that piece of knowledge really solidified my husband on like this alternative healthcare space. He's like, oh, there might be a little bit too, you know, those expensive lab tests that this doctor wanted to run on our son. And a couple of years later, I'd had my fourth child and that's when my hormones just, they just died. (laughs) I mean, I had had four kids in six years. Um, I wasn't sleeping. I, you know, had of course that like 20 pound weight gain. I just could not get off. I had zero libido. My hair was falling out like crazy. I was having anxiety attacks, like panic attacks. Every time I'd, I'd walk past my bedroom, um, I would just start panicking because I thought I'm not going to sleep tonight. How am I going to take care of my kids? How am I going to take care of my family. Um, so I was really kind of at the end of my rope and, um, hang on one second. Hey boys, I told you don't put the dishes away. Cause that's loud. Go outside right now, right now. Oh, you sound Turn like back. me in my house. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Just like that three minutes ago. <laughs> um, So, yeah, um, I, you know, things were just really a mess for me. And in the same vein, I'd gone, you know, from my general healthcare practitioner to my OB to a naturopath to, um, a a muscle testing practitioner in town, you know, four or five practitioners. And I have, you know, a ton of supplements. I had regular blood work and then I had a prescription for birth control and I had a prescription for an antidepressant. And I remember coming home and just thinking, I don't know if this is actually what's wrong with me. Like I've always been a pretty peppy person. I like normally have a a pretty good outlook on life. And I was like, do I want to be dependent on an antidepressant for a problem? I don't think I have. And it was right around that time that I was actually watching a lot of YouTube videos and an FDN was on talking about hormone imbalance. And she was describing these lab tests that she had access to a hormone panel, a gut test, you know, and I thought those are things my doctor never even told me about. I've never had a hormone panel run and I'm not sleeping and my hair's falling out. And so I just remember telling my husband, I'm like, listen, I need you to finance some more education for me, please. I got to do this. And he looks at it and he's like, oh, lab testing. Okay. Like he's all about, you know, the data and the numbers. So that was really, um, you know, attractive for him. Um, and I went through the FDN certification course. I was able to test myself all those labs that I was really excited to hear about. I got to run on myself 
And during the course of that time, I uncovered severe hormone dysfunction, shocker, right? <laughs> Almost flatline cortisol levels, no estrogen, no progesterone, um, no testosterone. I found a parasite in my gut that I was able to, you know, eradicate um, some pretty odd food sensitivities for me. Now that I run them on all my clients, I'm like, oh, it's not odd to be, you know, intolerant to cauliflower. But at the time I was eating it, you know, two or three times a day because it was a healthy paleo food. So running all those tests, getting my bio individual feedback and data, and then able to, you know, kind of address those things one at a time, completely changed my health. And of course, changed the health of, health of my family um, and just got me really into um, trying to serve a, a group of women who had kind of been overlooked by mainstream medicine, because the more I shared my story with people, the more I heard the feedback that they had been in the same boat. They're like, my lab tests look normal. My doctor said I was fine. I don't want to be in on antidepressant and I don't want to be on birth control. What's wrong with me? <laughs> And so I got to kind of segue into that niche of working with perimenopausal women that I just adore. I, I love, I love that group of women because there's so many ways that, you know, um, you know, using the dress protocol, I'm sure your, your listeners know about the dress protocol and holistic interventions can really make their quality of life just jump. Um, and they can start to feel so much better quickly by, by utilizing what we do at FDN. Yeah. I mean, your, your story is sounds so familiar, right? So many women and, you know, and I've shared my story, like mold was a big thing for me that just rock bottomed everything. Right. And if I hadn't taken it into my own hands with, of course, you know, other help from other people too, but we have to go outside the box mm -hmm. to like, start to, you know, especially when you have that innate sense that you're like, this doesn't make sense that I've been put on birth control and an antidepressant. And this is what I love talking about. And I'm so grateful, Jen, for that we get to talk about this today. Thank you for sharing part of your story um, because I think it will just help more women to realize like, wow, I'm not alone on this because that, I hear that all the time, right? right. Like one of my <laughs> signature programs is my core rehab program. So we do a lot with pelvic floor and diastasis mm -hmm. and healing the body through movement. And I get so many stories from women they're like, they share stuff with me and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm the only one that has this. And I'm like, no, this is why we need to be talking. And it's so funny, right? Women, we talk a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but why is it when we get together with, you know, friends, girlfriends, whatever, like there's like a limit as to like what kind of gets talked about, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many things or it's like the conversation of like, oh, well, that's just normal honey, that you're right, right. <laughs> some years old and your hair is starting to fall out and you feel like kind of like a crazy person, but mm -hmm. it's not you. It's because there's something deeper mm -hmm. going on. So mm -hmm. it's so exciting. I love this conversation. So, <laughs> okay. So I have so many things I want you to talk about. Um, first question I have for you is what is the, like, because everyone listening is like, okay, what can I do? So what is like the number one thing? Like, where do we start with all this? No matter like, we've got so many, women have so many symptoms going on. And again, the perimenopause thing, women don't realize, but that can start pretty young. Like I know 35 is kind of mm -hmm. like the norm, but I even know women who've gone fully into menopause before 40. And I right. think it's happening more often because of the toxic world that we live in. Um, but what is some of those initial things that you recommend to our women? Um, or like, what are what to like, look for, I guess, when maybe like the signs of like, perimenopause, so that we can yeah. even be aware that like, oh, maybe I am in perimenopause, and I'm only like 32, 36, yeah. Not even in my wheelhouse. Maybe I just had a baby even. And mm -hmm. like, you know, um, because nothing wrong with that. I worked with women over the years that have their first baby and they're 41, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> totally. Yes. Yeah. It it really can sneak up on you. And I think that's why women don't realize and that's why perimenopause isn't talked about because you realize that you're in it about five years down the line, right? Um, but there are definitely some things you can look for. And like you said, Erica, usually the perimenopausal age for women is somewhere between 35 and 50. But, you know, after I had my fourth baby, I was only 30 and I'm pretty convinced that my body had started going into perimenopause then. And, you know, 
I think the greatest, um, you know, source of, of perimenopausal stress is just that stress itself. And, you know, I know you talk about that all the time because it's at the root of many of our, you know, chronic illnesses and, and dysfunctions. And so if you've lived a life where you're constantly, you know, stressed out, you can probably, <laughs> you can probably predict that you might go into perimenopause a little bit earlier. And, To answer your question more fully, I I love this researcher, Dr. Gerilyn Pryor, who really wrote a lot on progesterone therapy in the 1990s. And she described perimenopause as a state of wildly fluctuating levels of estrogen. And, you know, until then doctors had really focused on the estrogen component, thinking that women were estrogen deficient during perimenopause. And so, you know, like the women's health initiative study and other, other smaller scale studies that were going on at the time, we're using synthetic estrogen and even bioidentical estrogen in women as, as perimenopause therapy. But really what we see is that most women have way too much estrogen. We are exposed to so much estrogen. I mean, for those of you who are listening, raise your hand. If you've been on the pill, (laughs) raise your hand. If you've been on an IUD, raise your hand. If you've been on Depro-Provera, like there are just so many ways that we've been exposed to estrogen, even from the time we were like 14, 15, 16 years old, not only is your body, you know, creating its own estrogen, three different forms of estrogen, but then we're bringing in those synthetic estrogens, right? We're exposed to estrogens in our environment and our foods and, you know, chemicals all around. There's this great book called Estro Generation by Dr. Anthony J, where he goes into 12 different areas of our, our, our world, our environment that women are constantly exposed to estrogen because of, and it gets a little crazy. You're like, oh my gosh, I need to like go live on the moon. (laughs) But just that book was enough to, you know, really reiterate that we, we are overexposed to estrogen. And that is the number one reason why so many women are experiencing, you know, heavy, heavy cramps, clotting blood flow, um, that's out of control, you know, endometriosis and cysts, um, premenstrual migraines, uh, acne, you know, hair loss, greasy skin, all these things that women are, you know, experiencing. They're like, I'm 40 years old. Why am I breaking out in acne, like a teenager. (laughs) And, you know, it's, it's due to all that estrogen. And then on the other hand, insufficient levels of progesterone. And we can talk more about how you can get into that with like some blood testing or, or saliva or or urine testing. But, um, symptomatically, you know, if you're experiencing a lot of those period problems, you, you're probably, you know, what we call estrogen dominant. And that is, the number one way that you can, you can be sure (laughs) that you're approaching those perimenopausal years is that you have this lull in period symptoms for a little bit, and now they're starting to increase in severity and intensity. Okay. There's so much to unpack here, Jennifer. (laughs) (laughs) So, okay. So with, you know, estrogen dominant, because here's something that I have seen as well is you don't have to have sky high estrogen to have estrogen dominance. Can we talk about this? Because this is, I think one of the most confusing things for women, because they might go say just to their doctor and get a serum blood dress. Let's talk about Mm -hmm. the difference of serum versus say the Dutch test. And my ladies who've listened to me for a while, I've had, um, uh, we've talked about the Dutch test quite a bit, which I love. It's so amazing. Um, and so the difference in that, but something that I've seen, and I know you see it too, is you can almost have like low estrogen on your labs, but it's also the balance you mentioned progesterone and also how we are detoxifying, um, estrogen. So can you talk Mm -hmm. about that? And so I'm going to add one more thing to this. And this is like a big loaded question, but there's so much Mm -hmm. here, um, is that, um, I cannot remember. I wish I could find where I found this at. And I remember reading because I've had, um, previously, not recently because I've improved so much of my health. Mm-hmm. Um, even though I always thought I was a healthy person and those of us right. that are, but we have these underlying things, right. Mm-hmm. Um, is who had ovarian cysts from the age of 14, mm-hmm. right? Like, um, and I remember, I wish I could, again, I wish I remember who it was from, but was talking about how we actually hold can hold like five times the amount of estrogen or in our like uterus ovary that doesn't really show up on a Dutch doesn't show up mm-hmm. in like serum level stuff. So this is what we have mm-hmm. to keep in mind. And what I love about FDN practitioners and being one and, you know, getting to do all this with um, clients is that 
when you start to recognize the symptoms, this is where I think we get so many women, right? They go to their doctor, they do the labs, their labs come back quote normal, but she's like, but I have all these symptoms. My periods are so heavy. They're so dark and clotty and I'm cramping Mm -hmm. and probably Mm -hmm. has cyst rupture. And I think a big part of it comes down to these different things. Like we're holding too much estrogen around Mm our uterus and the lining and all of that. Um, and we're not detoxifying it and all that. So can you talk more about what you're seeing, um, with the estrogen? So just like demystify a lot of this estrogen conversation. (laughs) Okay. I love that question. And this is something, you know, I get asked all the time, well, my estrogen levels look low or normal on my blood work. So my doctor says, you know, there's not an issue, but estrogen is, it's a, it's a steroid hormone. It's backbone It's cholesterol. So it's, it's actually bound up in your fat tissue and your body makes three different kinds of estrogen, not just one. So estradiol, right. is the strongest and most abundant estrogen in the body, but then your body also makes estrone a little bit in the fat tissue and estriol, which your body actually creates in the placenta while you're pregnant, but it also can be converted from estradiol and estriol. So we've got three different kinds of estrogen always circulating in the body, as well as, you know, the fact that again, estrogen is bound up in your fat tissue. So it's not coursing through your bloodstream all the time. Like we think it is, there's much of it that your body kind of sequesters and you guys, or you've just talked about, you know, the fact that it's also around your, your female organs, right? Like your, your breast tissue, and then also your uterus. And so you can't see on a blood test really what your estrogen levels are. And that's why I think you love the Dutch. And that's why I I love the Dutch. And even, you know, if you're doing saliva testing, you're able to look at more of that unbound and free estrogen. And so you get a much better idea of, you know, what's actually going on in the body. And I think it's a good time to make the distinction too on, on things like the Dutch test and even serum levels of, of estrogen. You're not looking at at, at synthetic estrogens, those only pick up, you know, endogenous or, or natural estrogens in the body. So if you're being exposed to, you know, chemicals or toxins or plastics or the birth control pill or Premarin, that's not going to be picked up on, on these laboratory tests. So that's why, you know, my, my theory is when women are so much more estrogen, estrogen dominant than we even think we are, because we can't really measure those synthetic estrogens, but the, the smell tests for that is, you know, how bad your period is. Right. Um, or maybe the absence of a period, right. Period problems, just kind of in general. Um, so you asked also about, you know, how your body metabolizes those estrogens, right. Cause you have to get rid of them. Um, something really interesting about steroid hormones is that they're, they're actually addictive. Like your body gets used to a certain amount of them. And so if you're, you know, not excreting them, they're being reuptaken into the body and you get used to this like higher level of hormones. So that's why, you know, sometimes when women go off the pill or they go off bioidentical estrogen, um, they feel really crappy for a period of time because they're used to like this almost, you know, a a steroid effect, right. Of, of estrogen in particular. Um, and so the body really wants to excrete it. It needs to get rid of that excess estrogen and it does that by metabolizing it down three different pathways in the body. And that's something we look at in the Dutch test, which is really kind of fun because you can kind of look at, you know, women's propensity toward um, maybe some, some estrogen issues in the future. You know, if you're not excreting that estrogen appropriately, or, you know, we can look at methylation and, and, and sulfation and conjugation, all those fun things on the Dutch test. Um, If that's not happening appropriately, you, you can be damn sure that you're going to experience, you know, some of those period issues in spades. So that's why, you know, we say all the time, tests don't guess, because you really don't want to guess when it comes to your period, especially if you're in perimenopause and you're dealing with all the other things you have to worry about in your life. Right. Yeah. I feel like our periods are a very good marker of our health. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And I look back at, there was a period of mine where I was like, they were (laughs) not good. And I knew something was wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, a big part of it was a toxicity load. And I, which I think Mm -hmm. whether it's mold or heavy metals or estrogen, you know, just because it's in everything. That's why I always talk about like just switching out your products can be Mm -hmm. so powerful for your body. So we're not getting and eating better quality food so that we are minimizing um, all of that. So 
something else. And I would love for you to speak to this because I think this is really cool about the Dutch test. Um, when I learned about this and I was like, Ooh, this is the reason why every single woman needs to run one at some point is to make sure, because we talked about the three different estrogens, but making sure mm-hmm. they're in the right balance mm-hmm. because if they're out of balance with each other, then it could mean like, if you, you know, if cancer was to be, come from, I mean, technically, right. They say we have cancer cells in our body. So mm-hmm. if some of them were, able, were becoming more predominant and starting to take over part of the body and our estrogens are out of balance and we have the estrogen that could be more damaging, could actually encourage cancer to grow. And I always think that this is a big piece that we haven't, um, haven't really dove into much, especially when we start talking breast cancer and all that. Like, I'd love to see research done with women who have breast cancer and what does their Dutch test look like? You know, is it because, you know, were they more predisposed to it because of their pathways? Um, Mm -hmm. we don't know. I know we don't know the answer unless you've come across research or studies with that yet. I don't know. I haven't. (laughs) I I haven't. It's such a great question though. And it's really, it's, I love the little pie chart that we get on the Dutch because Mm -hmm. you can see the breakdown of estrogen metabolism. And it's like the first page I go to, cause I find it so fascinating. And, you know, of course we're not doctors, we don't diagnose, treat or prescribe, but we, we can do some really good teaching off of the Dutch test for clients. So, um, you know, there, there are three pathways that your body will excrete estrogen down. There's the, the two hydroxy pathway and on the Dutch test, that looks like two dash OH two hydroxy pathway. And that's really the safest pathway for your body to get rid of estrogen. And when I'm explaining it to clients, I always tell them like, think of a big river and then three tributaries, right? Like these things have to happen. It's a downstream action, but at at some point in the game, your body splits these estrogens down different pathways. And one of the pathways is free flowing. One of them's kind of gummed up a little bit with like rocks, you know, and the other one is just trashed. (laughs) It just has, you know, you know, toxins and chemicals and pollutants and dead fish and whatnot, right? We don't want that pathway. Um, so we really want our body to metabolize estrogen down that two hydroxy pathway. But if there's inflammation, if there's gut parasites, if you've got like, like Erica said, um, you know, mold or, or Lyme or chronic infections or illness, you know, a, a whole number of factors, the body's going to push estrogen down either the four hydroxy pathway, which is not as safe as the two hydroxy or the really unsafe pathway, the 16 hydroxy pathway. And that, you know, the Dutch test does show you really in a pictorial form what that looks like. So it's easy to see, you know, the, the two hydroxy pathways in green. So we're like, yay, if it's lit up, that means go right. Uh, <laughs> but if you've got those blue or red markers that are more, um, you know, representative in your, in your pie chart, you're looking at some issues. And like you said, you know, we have, we do have the research that shows that those pathways are, are not as, as safe because they can increase your likelihood for experiencing yes, estrogen dominant cancers. Um, and I never want to scare my clients. I always tell them like, look, we caught this early. I'm not a doctor. This is something you can take to your doctor, but it's also a great time for us to start working on establishing that correct pathway and communication. So we can run the other labs, you know, we can use some really great supplements like DIM or indole three carbonyl, and we can really dive into the dietary component with some of my very favorite foods that push estrogen metabolism down that two hydroxy pathway and make it really safe for the body to do. And the coolest thing I think about the body is it wants to be in balance. It's created to be in balance, right? And so if we give our body the correct tools, to do what it needs to do, to do what it's supposed to do, um, things start to shift quickly. And I've actually seen within a month um, that that pathway metabolism change just with some dietary and supplement interventions. I don't know if you've seen the same thing, but it's pretty cool to watch. Yeah. Oh, I have. I've had women um, and myself making, when you can make changes within, by that next cycle, 30-ish days, you can see huge improvement. I have clients that are like, oh my gosh, Erica, my boobs don't hurt, you know, for the first time. And I'm like, literally it's been a month and I'm Mm -hmm. like, this is so amazing. It's like, oh my gosh, my periods are getting a little bit calmer. Like I these, I'm like, it's so quick. And it is, I love that you said like the body likes to be in balance. I'm always Mm -hmm. talking about this. Like our body really has the power to heal itself. We just have to give it the right guidance and tools that it's looking for. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's so, it's so fascinating what the body can do. And, and one other thing, and I love that you also mentioned that too, of like, you know, we don't diagnose, but I love that we can get the information, right? This is stuff that we can now have that even what, 10 years ago, we really didn't have mm-hmm. the capability to, to see and find out. And that's what I'm always talking about and acknowledge is power. So when we learn this stuff right. and we can do something, when we can do something about it because, and it's never too late to work, to turn around, um, your health and all of that. So you had mentioned something about some foods that you always recommend for our ladies, um, mm-hmm. that you notice help to improve their periods. Can you share some of the top couple foods? Oh, I would love to. I am. I'm just a huge proponent of healing whole foods, right? Like I, I just know that, um, even the supplement industry is, is a newer industry and largely unregulated. We've seen that in the last year with the government now trying to step in and, and kind of like take away B12 and, and acetylcysteine. Um, but how much more bioavailable are nutrients in whole foods that your, your body can assimilate and use. Um, and so I love starting with food, right. And something I have my clients do is actually download the app chronometer and just go through three or four days of your diet and see how close you are to meeting even your RDA, your recommended daily allowance for, you know, vitamins and minerals and macronutrients. And most women, like we think we eat pretty healthy, but we're not even close. Like, are we getting anywhere near a hundred grams of protein a day? Not even close, you know? Can you get anywhere near like your, your B12 or your B6 for the day? Most women don't, even though they're eating like a pretty healthy diet. So, um, I always like to start with food and a couple of my favorites for estrogen metabolism, um, are well, number one, the carrot. I'm kind of obsessed with carrots. Uh, I think they are. So first of all, they're delicious. And second of all, they, they really have this unique, um, property where they help the body detoxify that, that toxic estradiol. There's a great researcher, Dr. Ray Peet, who has publicized this research. Um, this is what he actually wrote his, his, you know, um, dissertation on. And so, uh, you can look him up if you want to, you guys who are listening to this, but, uh, the insoluble fiber in carrots kind of sweeps through the digestive tract and allows the body to pull out that excess estrogen because you've got to, you've got to poop out your estrogen. <laughs> That's the only way to get rid of it, you know, at the end of the day. Um, and carrots can help with that too. So I recommend that my clients do like one to two raw carrots a day. And that can turn things around pretty quick from a, a symptomatic um, standpoint. So yeah, like you were saying, tender boobies, right? Heavy flow, migraines, because you're getting such good nutrients. And then it's also helping your, your digestion, your bowels and that, that estrogen excretion. But other great um, kind of estrogen blocking, I would say, um, foods would be flaxseed, almonds, raspberries, and prunes. So I try to have my clients get at least one serving of each of those foods a day at the beginning of their program, just so they can start to push estrogen down the correct pathways. Um, that's actually from Dr. Elisa Pomeroy, um, who has this great graphic on, on foods that can help push estrogen down, down the right pathway. That's awesome. Okay. So two questions with food. What are your thoughts on broccoli sprouts? Because do you, do you like them? Do you not like them? Are you indifferent? (laughs) Okay. So I like, so do you know, Rhonda Patrick? Um, she, okay. She's a huge proponent of, of broccoli sprouts. She's got like a podcast where all she talks about is broccoli sprouts and, um, they are fantastic for detoxification and really concentrated sources of sulforaphane. Right. And then that, that indole three carbonyl, which is what we're trying to get through the supplementation and then also dim diendole methane. So we're getting like those, those methane and those sulfur components through broccoli sprouts. And since it's such a young food and so full of enzymatic activity, your body assimilates them much better than it might from, you know, mature broccoli even, and more than supplements because supplements are still, they're great, but they're not whole living foods. Um, so I'm a huge fan of broccoli sprouts. Um, if you like them and if you can tolerate them, oh, you're, you're clapping. Do you love broccoli sprouts? I do. I always okay. just have, I always just have my clients put them on their salads. Like whenever you have yes. a salad, just throw some broccoli sprouts on them. And honestly, you can grow them at your house really cheaply. Mm-hmm. And I think it is, I know you said if they like them, but, um, they're very like, yeah, they have, you know, a distinct 
flavor, but I think when you put it, <laughs> when you put it in everything and it's just like mm-hmm. anything with foods, right? Mm-hmm. You just have to like, maybe you start with a little bit and you just like slowly change your taste buds. But it's one of the first things I always recommend to my clients when we're working on getting estrogen moving onto the, I'm like, add those uh, broccoli sprouts. And I've never had anyone like refuse to do it. So <laughs> I love that. I love it. It's such a simple and effective change. I love the carrots. I did not know about carrots, but I I personally love to eat them. So I'm like, okay, I'll have to start (laughs) recommending everyone eat more carrots. Um, Carrots are like, I think one of those, like, they're just like, it's a good, easy food for everyone to eat. So eat more of them. Don't overdo them. Don't overdo them or you will start to turn orange. We have... I know we know someone who like loves carrots and uh-huh. like, his hands are literally legitimately like have an orange tint to them because he eats so many carrots. So, like maybe you need to back off. Maybe we need to like switch some of those carrots out for something else, some celery or some right. <laughs> bell yeah. peppers. Balance, please. Balance. Balance. Yes. yes. My mom actually had the same thing. I think I have really? my love <laughs> carrots from my mom, but she, she, her skin turned orange when she was like 25 years old because she ate so many carrots. Yeah. But- <laughs> yeah. So don't overdo the carrots, ladies. Would you say like one to two? And you're talking like whole carrots. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. whole carrots. Yeah, yeah, just a normal like big carrot. I literally throw them in my purse. I keep them like you know for oh, snacks. They're really great with a half a cup of almonds or a quarter cup of almonds. It makes like a really great afternoon snack. So, so yeah. if we did the "What's in Your Purse" challenge, Jennifer would win. Most unique carrots. <laughs> I can get some unique stuff in my purse, but I've yet I haven't done that. I'll have to start. You've inspired me. I'll start carrying carrot with. <laughs> I love it. Send me a picture when you do. Okay. (laughs) I love it. I love the weird and unusual things. It's right up my alley. Okay. So next question, because we're talking about food is, and I know you um, are a fan of this, is getting women to eat more protein, specifically animal protein. Okay. This is a hard conversation to have with women. I find, um, so let's tackle that first. And then let's talk about, I want to talk about those who are vegan and don't eat animal protein and how that works with our hormones, because So I guess the first big part of this is why, Jennifer, do women need more animal protein in their diets? Yes. Okay. So many reasons, but let's start with the number one reason why women need more animal protein because we have sugar cravings. So I'm sure every woman listening to this is like, I struggle with sugar. No matter how healthy I eat, I totally have sugar cravings. And I can tell you that's because you are not eating enough protein. If your body is, you know, asking you for more sugar, what it's really asking for is more energy. And I love Dr. Ted Naiman on this. He has the protein to energy hypothesis, and it's actually a grid you can find online with, with different, like, you know, pictorial representations of food, but the more protein that you eat, the more satisfied your body is, his, his hypothesis is that our bodies are kind of programmed and wired to search for food until we've reached a set number of protein grams for the day. So this is why women can kind of snack all day long on seemingly healthy food, like have, you know, half cup of oatmeal and then have like a banana and then have, you know, half of a sandwich on gluten-free bread. And then by the time at 6 PM, they're like eating 20 of their kids, chicken nuggets, because they're like, I'm so hungry and I don't understand. I've eaten so healthy today, but have you eaten your protein? It's protein that turns off kind of that, that, that switch, that hunger switch and, and leptin and ghrelin are two hunger hormones, right? So leptin is our, our satiety hormone and ghrelin's our hunger hormone. I always think of ghrelin as like, grr, I'm hungry, right? So <laughs> if you can get enough protein, that ghrelin monster shuts off and your leptin is activated, signaling that you've had enough food for the day. Protein also, animal protein specifically, has four calories per gram. So if you're getting 100 grams of protein, which I, again, can almost guarantee you no one is, that's only 400 calories. So it's really satiating, but it's also great if you're trying to, as most women in perimenopause are, either keep their figure or, you know, return to the figure that they really want. Um, protein super satisfying. It also is, you know, not really efficient at creating energy, but it is really efficient at rebuilding your body. And if you think about, you know, yourself in perimenopause, again, anywhere from like age 32 to 55, right? Women are usually complaining of muscle breakdown. Like they just can't build muscle like they used to. 
their bodies are hurting. A lot of women have like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. A lot of women are suffering from complications of mold issues or, um, you know, chronic health issues like autoimmune disease. It takes a lot of raw materials for our bodies to rebuild themselves effectively. And where does that come from? It comes from amino acids, which you get from meat. You can't get that from pea protein. You can't get that from, you know, tofu. You can get it from, from meat, right? And the other thing I like to tell women is, is to create an entire hormone cascade. So to have healthy levels of estrogen and progesterone and cortisol and testosterone, your body starts that hormone cascade with acetyl coenzyme A. And, and to even create that in the body, you need sufficient amounts of B vitamins and dietary fats. And B vitamins and dietary fats in the perfect ratio are only found in meat products. So I understand that a lot of women, you know, we don't come from like a meat heavy background, most of us. And we think that, you know, we sort of need to, to pick at our food. I love this quote from Laura Bryden, Dr. Laura Bryden, who says, you deserve so much more food than you were led to believe. <laughs> I love that quote. <laughs> so it's okay if you eat, you know, protein a couple of times a day, you deserve it. You don't have to eat like a bird. Um, and it's so just to recap, shuts off sugar cravings, helps your body build and repair itself and really gives you energy. So I think those are three pretty darn good reasons to start eating a little bit more animal protein. And, um, I know you asked too, Erica, like, what about, you know, our vegan clients? And I get that. I, I mean, if it's a, a moral or religious reason, like we respect that. And that is, you know, something that might be cultural for you. Um, and something that is definitely like your own personal preference. So I'm not going to make you eat meat. I just want to educate you and kind of share with you maybe why you're, you know, eating Oreos every night, <laughs> maybe why you, you know, can sleep 10 hours a day and still not feel like you're, you've got energy in the morning. And maybe why, you know, your muscles starting to break down, you're getting more cellulite and dimples on your butt, you know, where it used to be like nice and perky. Now you're like, where did that go? <laughs> you might want to try eating some more meat. So for those that have a hard time eating more animal protein for whatever reason, do like, okay, so what about, you know, obviously I know we're not getting all those amino acids, even from like your hemp proteins and your pea proteins. They're getting protein. Yes. Um, but then on top of that, they really need to be taking, you know, some amino acid and B, B vitamin supplementation mm -hmm. because they're just not getting that at all right, in their right. diet. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So you're asking like about some, some alternative ways to get it through supplementation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love that question. Cause again, if you, if you just can't do it, but I, I totally understand I want to like preface that too, with the fact that many clients who, or just many women, right. in your audience who maybe haven't eaten a lot of meat in their background, they start trying to eat meat and they're like, I don't digest this well. Like I can't, I feel like it's sitting in my stomach. I feel like I start having acid reflux. Like I can't do that. And that's really, you know, a chicken and egg sort of effect because the less you eat meat, and the more you eat vegetables, your stomach acid starts to change on, on the pH scale, right? Like pH scale goes from zero to eight and your stomach acid is supposed to be between a 0.8 and a 2.5 on the pH scale. So it's very, very acidic. But the more we start to eat like, you know, cows or bunny rabbits, the more our stomach acidity turns quite alkaline, which is, you know, where, where ruminants have very alkaline stomach acid. They don't need that strong stomach acid to break down meat because they're mostly eating plants. And your stomach can start to follow suit. So legitimately, you're not having a hard time breaking down that protein. So it's not all in your head. So if that's you, when you've been on a more plant-based diet and you want to try a little bit more protein, do some digestive enzymes or some digestive aid like lemon or apple cider vinegar or digestive bitters or some betaine HCL or, or like I said, just straight up digestive enzyme to help your body adapt. And the more you practice, just like anything else, the better you'll get. Um, but if meat's off the table for you, then there's a couple of things I love. If you're vegetarian, but not vegan, um, and if you're open to it, you can add collagen protein to your smoothies, your soups, your coffee, um, you know, your tea, even water. Um, collagen protein does lack the essential amino acid tryptophan though. So it can start to kind of mess with your sleep. 
and your mood if you're not getting tryptophan. You want to be careful there. Um, but I also like free form amino acids. Designs for Health has a great product called Amino Acid Supreme, which is a, a powder that you can put into water. And it doesn't taste great, but they've tried to mask that with some berry. I appreciate. Um, but you're at least you're getting your amino acids. So if you're, you know, recovering from exercise or a surgery or something. I'd encourage you to at least seek that out for a temporary period of time. Yeah, that's good to know. So I want to circle kind of back to something you mentioned about hormones and cholesterol and gut health. I know we're kind of talking a little bit with like stomach and, you know, um, and all of that. So like you and I both know that hormones ultimately are dramatically affected by our gut health, what our liver is doing, our detoxification, which we talked about a little bit. Um, and so this is why I like, I love talking, you know, Dutch tests and hormones and all that, but you know, it's, it, we have to go even deeper than that because the hormones are not the root of the hormones. Right. Right. <laughs> so where do you start with your clients when it comes to like, okay, we know you know, okay, she's in perimenopause. She's got a roller coaster of hormones going on, most likely estrogen dominant, right? Her progesterone's probably on the low side. Um, her cortisol maybe even plummeted because she's been so stressed for so long. And so where do we, where do you go with your clients with, you know, with the gut health aspect of it? Yes. Oh my goodness. Um, and that's a, a big time. question, by the no, way. <laughs> Sorry. So like you could totally simplify it because we've already okay. been talking for a long time. So like, what are kind of your top things? <laughs> what are your like top things um, okay. with gut health? <laughs> that's helpful. I will run the Dutch first and for, or the, the GI map. Yes. Um, first and foremost, I always run the Dutch and the GI map together. So we're looking for, you know, bacteria that are out of balance and then parasites are a huge thing I'm looking for. Um, I actually love this product called Mimosa Pudica. It's Para One from Cellcore, but on the on the client side, it's it's Mimosa Pudica, and that's something I stack into all of my client protocols because it is a a like a compound. It's a plant compound that helps paralyze any little critters that are hanging on in your intestines. Um, sometimes, you know, when you're doing parasite or bacteria clearing uh, protocols they're, they won't let go, you know, they're literally parasites. They're, they're, you know, latching on for dear life onto your, your small intestine. So this kind of, it paralyzes those critters. And I've seen some amazing pictures from people, things that, you know, come out of their butt. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so I, I start there. <laughs> yes. We're talking about poop ladies. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so all day. <laughs> it's so important. We have to talk about poop. <laughs> So that's one thing I start with. And then, you know, doing a gut friendly diet, because that's, a, that's an immediate intervention that I can do with clients. You know, everyone is presenting with, you know, bloating, constipation, sorry, diarrhea, like those really like that's legit what, what people are experiencing with their hormone imbalance. And so calming down the gut through diet can be really helpful. And so I do, you know, smoothies, shakes, and stews. Um, and so I'll have my clients do kind of like a pre-digested, um, food paradigm for three to five days. Their body just doesn't have to work so hard to digest their food. And that can usually cut down on bloating, um, and increase their energy because their body's not working so hard to uh, break down that food. Um, so that's like kind of my SOS clients, right? The mimosa pudica, um, and the, the food interventions. And then we wait for the GI map test results to come in. Um, and then I really am a big fan of kind of the functional medicine paradigm of, you know, removing and then re-inoculating, restoring. And so moving through, um, gut clearing and then, and then like restoring protocols, it takes a long time. Um, and so I just ask clients to be really patient with their tummies, <laughs> um, cause it can take a while for your tummy to come back into balance. Um, and the third and final thing we do is work on stress because we know that the vagus nerve, you know, is the, the most important nerve in the body. And if you're in sympathetic mode, more often than you're in parasympathetic mode and your vagus nerve never gets a chance to activate like your rest and digest cycle of your body, you're going to have tummy issues, no matter what you do dietarily or supplementary. So supplementarily, is that a word? Anyway, oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> with supplements. 
Um, so we really, really work on that stress component. And I'd say that's mm-hmm. like the largest part of what I do with my clients. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. Can we talk a little bit more about the stress component? I feel like stress and digestion stuff come up in like one of the two or both in almost every conversation. doesn't matter like what we're talking about. I feel like on here. And, um, I wholeheartedly agree with you with the stress component. And I say this too, like there's, you cannot out supplement or out eat stress. Right. So we have to start to understand our body and something that I see, and I'm sure you do too. Um, and I want us to talk about this a little bit more is that I think so many women get to this point in their life and they're say mid-ish thirties, um, that they are really stressed, but they don't even know it because it has been <laughs> like, it just starts like we, I've had this conversation, um, Dr. Marisa Snyder, we talked about this a lot on the episode I did with her a while back. And I love how she talked about, like she sees with women, it starts. And I was like, oh my God, I had a light bulb moment in this conversation <laughs> with her. I was like, oh, that's when I started too, was like in college, right? Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. go to most of us, not everybody, but again, kind of in general, the story goes like you go to college um, and you know, you're, you're younger. So you can like burn the candle at all hours of the day, right? You stay up late studying, you maybe go out partying, you're like, you're doing all the social stuff and trying to just cram in all the studies. And then you go into the real world and then you, you know, have kiddos and, you know, um, you know, a marriage and you have all these things and just work. And it's like one thing after the other. And then 10, 15, 20 years later, all of a sudden you're like, man, I feel like I'm falling apart. And it really all, a lot of it traces back to stress management and us really mm-hmm. our bodies. So I see, right. So many women are so stressed and maybe they know it, but maybe they don't understand the degree to which they are stressed. So it's like really having to get her like back to her baseline, which is still stressed. And then actually go to a, this, like find a whole new level of de-stressing that she's honestly probably never experienced in her life, except maybe as a child. And we don't talk about stress with kids, so they don't really understand and recognize it. <laughs> like, do you see that too? Like women just have a hard time in that initial like baseline. And then we've got to bring her even below that, ba- her, her baseline. <laughs> does that right. make sense? <laughs> it totally does. And I love that you brought that up and, you know, I'm totally tracking with you too, just thinking about my own college experience and, how quickly, you know, you just go from being a a kid to being an adult. There's really not a transition. You just go full force ahead. And most of us were like working or playing sports at the same time we were taking classes and learn, just learning how to be an adult. Right. Um, it's a big stressor, uh, and it doesn't really, you you don't pull back from it. It never stops. Um, and so generally, yeah, like maybe 17, 18 at the same time, what, what else is happening? You go on the pill, <laughs> you know, you're going on birth control. Um, you're eating crappy food because your parents only pay for one meal a day at your dorm, <laughs> you know, like there's just so much happening at that time. So, um, I, I agree with you there. And I was actually just talking with a client this week who she was insisting. She's like, I'm not stressed. I'm not stressed. Like I, I love my job. I love my family. I don't have, you know, extended family I'm having to care for, but here's, here's how I quantify that for my clients. We track heart rate variability. So I'm making them, you know, get, get down with their parasympathetic nervous system. And you can actually see, you know, how much with HRV, you can track total power. So how much total power your body's actually producing that day. And at that point you can really start to um, you know, figure out, am, is it a day where I'm going to work out? Is it a day where I need more protein? Is it a day where I need to sleep more? Um, because your body's speaking to you via like your, your heart rate. And that's a great way to really quantify stress, especially for people who, um, are really insistent that they're not stressed. And I think that that's probably 30% of my clients. You, you too, Erica, you probably work with like type A driven perfectionistic women. Cause these are the women that end up getting sick in the way, um, that, you know, we can serve people at FDN. Um, and so you can operate at this really high level of performance for a really long time because you can handle everything that life throws at you. Um, and seemingly you're not stressed because you're handling it all, but that doesn't mean that it's not doing something to the inside of your body. 
And that's really where we, you know, gather that stress. It's not that we are snapping at our kids or it's, you know, that we're, you know, crying in the bathroom, right? It's that your body's internally starting to break down. It's affecting your heart rate. It's affecting your cortisol levels, um, you know, and it's affecting your hormones. So yes, I think that we start to get stressed really early and we don't ever get a break. And since that becomes the norm for so many women, they don't realize that it's, it, in the grand scheme of things is abnormal. We have that phrase, you know, common, but not normal. And that's really the amount of stress that Western women, you know, are experiencing on a day-to-day basis. It's common, but it's not normal. Absolutely. That's a great way of phrasing that. (laughs) So Jennifer, will you, okay. So when you're talking about like tracking heart rate, are you just having your clients like take their heart rate periodically throughout the day and like getting a good baseline, like first thing in the morning, or do you have them track and all of that? Like do you wear a tracker or a ring, something like that? Not aura rings. I do have them use a chest strap in some cases okay. or a, um, like a heart math monitor. So I'm heart math certified and I am going through another certification course on heart rate variability right now. Cause I think it's so fascinating. And in a nutshell, it's this, when you, when you breathe in your heart rate increases very imperceptibly, imperceptibly. <laughs> And then when you breathe out, when you exhale, your heart rate actually slows down just a little bit. And it's that, that, you know, exhale that really activates that the vagus nerve and your parasympathetic nervous system. And most of us, if you find yourself kind of, you know, in a stressful situation or just going about your day to day, you'll realize you're breathing fairly shallowly. Um, you're not taking those really deep breaths. You're never actually able to allow your vagus nerve to activate your parasympathetic nervous system. So you're in this state of physical stress all day long, even though your brain doesn't necessarily recognize it. And so by tracking heart rate variability, which is the, it's, it's really the variable between like sine waves. So if you just think of like a, you know, a heart rate on a piece of paper, right. The heart rate variability is the amount of time between each one of those heart rates. And when you're in what we at HeartMath call coherence, like in a coherent state, your heart rate's going to look really normal and it's going to go up and down. It's going to look like a regular heartbeat. But when you're in a state of like incoherence, when your body's really stressed, it'll start to look really erratic. And you can kind of quantify that with your breathing. And it, it actually, there's some great research showing that when that's happening in your body, your cortisol levels are being negatively affected. But when you're in a state of coherence with heart rate variability, then your DHEA levels are actually starting to rise in the body, which we know is like more anabolic and more healing. So I could talk for like five days on it. I think it's so fascinating, but I will quantify that with clients with a heart rate, a, a chest step. I love this. And I love heart math too. I was, I was going to be my next question is, are you doing stuff with heart math? Cause I yes. have one and I, I, it's on my list to dive in deeper because I do a lot teaching with breath work as well. Mm -hmm. And it's really, I love it. I love, um, teaching women. Um, it's always something I bring awareness to, especially in core rehab, because we're doing so much like mind body breath Mm -hmm. with the pelvic floor. And in the beginning, most women, I'd say probably 95% of them are like, Erica, I can't breathe past my chest. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to like, you have to be okay with where you are because the second you go, Oh my God, I'm only breathing in my chest. Like, what do you do? Your stress increases and your breath restricts even more. So ladies, if you just feel your breath into your chest, like just acknowledge that's a, that's where you're at. That's your starting point. And mm-hmm. like, there's this whole thing. Like, I love talking stress. I love talking breath because it's so powerful. And at the end of the day, it is such a big part of all of our healing journey. Mm-hmm. Um, Jennifer, maybe I'll have to have you back and we're going to have to do like a part two and talk about heart rate variability and all of that. Cause it. It's so fun. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. We've been talking for like almost an hour now and I can keep <laughs> going with you, but I don't want to take any more of your time. So Jennifer, will you, thank you so much. This has been so good to just go deeper into some of this and really have your perspective on everything. I'm so grateful um, to have met you and cross paths and um, I'm, you know, always learning, always learning. It's so great. Right. Um, will you share with everyone? I know you have a program, um, that you teach, you have a group program and anything else. I'd love for you to just share that with our listeners and, you know, if anyone is interested, I mean, you are such a wealth of knowledge. So thanks Erica. And thank you for having me on. This was such a joy. I really could talk to you for like, you know, five hours about this stuff. Thank you. Um, yeah. So you can find me at jenniferwoodwardnutrition.com. I am on Facebook and Instagram at Jennifer Woodward Nutrition. 
Uh, my signature program is called Better Periods, and we're actually just finishing up our beta program right now. We've had some amazing results with this great group of women who have worked so hard to really, you know, create a better period and balance their hormones and get their energy, sleep, libido all back on track. Um, and they're definitely in the throes of perimenopause. So it's been really fun to work together. Um, but I just wanted to say, yeah, thank you. Thanks for letting me chat with you today. I love yeah. this stuff. Thank you so much, Jennifer and ladies, definitely, um, check her program out. Um, so thank you so much. This was so great. Thanks Erica.